Welcome to the Sydney International Guest Speakers Meeting held on the 14th of November 2021. Emotional sobriety begins when one adult child talks with another adult child sharing his experience, strength and hope. Today, we are lucky to have Ken F, who is a renowned author and a member of ACA, and he is coming to speak on the right to clarity, removing our distorted filters and protecting ourselves from others' distorted projections. Uh, please join me in welcoming Ken F to the Zoom microphone. Welcome, Ken. Welcome, Ken. Thank you, everybody. I am so excited to be here and privileged. I want to tell everybody how much I love Sydney. Sydney, Sydney is one of my favorite cities. And uh, I'm really happy because uh, ABBA put out a new album. And I know that ABBA is kind of on the map because of Australia. And I think because of your love for ABBA. And it's important to me because I told everybody that, um, you know, when I was growing up in the 70s, we didn't have Prozac. We had ABBA. So that's kind of where my, my childhood was. So uh, thank you today. Clarity. How do we see the world with clarity? What I would like to talk about today is pretty much the basis of what we call cognitive behavioral therapy, but from the perspective of the ACA fellowship. I think there's a great blending of the two, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Uh, so what if we all saw the world with clarity? I think if we saw things clearly, there wouldn't be a lot of disagreements. There wouldn't be a lot of anger or a lot of frustration. I think there'd be a lot of harmony. But we all see the world a little bit differently. And the reason we do that is because we all have a different perspective kind of based on what we were learned. And um, I like to think of it as uh, a pair of sunglasses. You know, when, when we're kids, we're kind of blank screens. And I think we might have clarity if we were given the opportunity to see the world um, as clear as it could be. But unfortunately, we have parents and other people around us who give us a way of filtering what we see. And we tend to live through life looking at things through, through these filters as if we each have a different pair of sunglasses. And if you can imagine that if all of you had a different pair of sunglasses on with a different tint and you all got together to try to make a poster for a meeting or try to decorate a room, everybody is looking at the world a little bit differently. And because of that, uh, we get a little frustrated because we kind of expect others to see things the way that we see things. Uh, but that just doesn't happen. If you know somebody who's colorblind and you try having a conversation with them, it's similar. Uh, I tend to be uh, taste colorblind. I had some nasal surgery a few years back. And after that, I just don't smell things or taste things the way that I used to. So um, me trying to discuss food with some people and what tastes good and what doesn't taste good is, is really not an option. So oftentimes when people ask me how things taste, I, I prefer not to answer because my perspective I know is gonna to be totally different than other people's perspectives. And what happens when we wear these, these filters is we become very defensive because this is how we see the world and we kind of wanna hold on to our belief system. And when we're defensive and everyone around us is holding on to their filters, uh, this is kind of where a lot of the hurt feelings come in. And I believe that the ultimate goal in program, whether you're working ACA, AA, whatever program you're in, the ultimate goal is serenity or emotional recovery. And I think the best way to achieve this is to start to work on seeing the world with clarity. Now, we can't always remove our filters, but I do think if we become aware of our filters, that we could possibly adjust and compensate for what we have in the way that we see things. Almost like if you have an old photograph that is faded and yellowing, if you were to maybe scan it into your computer and put kind of a blue uh, screen on there, that might pop the colors back out again. So what you're doing is you're adjusting for 
you know, kind of the filter and what you're seeing. And it's important to understand what these filters are first before we can start to adjust them. I think when we grow up in households where there's a lot of chaos and a lot of dysfunction, we are kind of primed to avoid serenity. It's almost like if I were wearing these sunglasses for a long time and all of a sudden took them off, I might feel kind of naked and exposed. You know, give me back my, 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 my filter because this is how I'm used to seeing the world and this is what's comfortable for me. So recovery is learning how to kind of get comfortable with that, get comfortable with a new normal and hopefully a, a healthier new normal. We learn so many things from the world around us when we're kids. Uh, I, I think, I'm not sure of the statistics, but I think we learn more like the first three or four years of our life than we learn the entire rest of our life. And I know as parents, sometimes we think that we teach our kids certain things. Like if we see our kid reaching for a stove, you know, we, we, we tell them no, maybe we slap their hand and we say, no, that's bad. And we think that we're teaching them about the world by what we tell them and how we instruct them, whether we're instructing them to brush their teeth, brush the toilet, use utensils. But we also teach our kids our attitude and the way that we see the world. So if we are anxious about something and our kids see that anxiety, there's kind of a really primal instinct in us to absorb what's happening with our parents. And if we see a parent is stressed or frustrated or in distress, guess what we're going to interpret that as? We're gonna see ourselves as being in a situation that is not safe and that we have to be on hypervigilance and must always be stressed and on alert. So we absorb this from our parents. And I know that most of the people that end up in these rooms came from families where they've absorbed some of this on some level. Um, they were given some filter from their parents. And here we are today to try to determine what those are so that we can get rid of them and see the world a little bit clearly. One of the filters that I grew up with was hearing about how far everything was. We didn't visit family very often because they lived on the other side of Los Angeles. It was about 50 miles away and it took an hour to get there. And we didn't see them because it was too far. Uh, we didn't go to certain stores because my mother would complain that, you know, it's, it's, it's an effort to get over there. Everything is too far. I kind of early on realized that, um, that you had to be close by things because everything was too far. And when I was young, I started riding my bicycle and it was strange because the world didn't seem to be as remote and distant as my parents had made it out to be. And one of the things that I did to kind of over, overcome this, and I think the earlier that we work on overcoming these filters, the easier they are to get rid of. So I was like in my late turn, teens, early 20s, when I started doing a lot of bicycle riding. And one day I decided that I was going to ride my bicycle with a friend over to my grandmother's house for lunch. And we got up early in the morning, we pulled out of the house around 6.30, 7 o'clock, got to my grandmother's, which was about 60 miles the way we rode, um, up to Malibu, over the mountains, into the San Fernando Valley, got there about one o'clock, had lunch, and uh, three o'clock left to, to ride home, and it was about 112 miles. And when I did that, it was like, wow, maybe what my parents said wasn't true. Maybe there was some inaccuracy in this, because the world isn't as, uh, as large as they make it out to be, and things don't have to be as far and remote and distant. And uh, a couple of years later, uh, I had a whole bunch of people in one week, three different people asked me to do long, huge bicycle trips. And the third one, a friend of mine from Chicago called me and said, hey, let's ride our bicycles to Chicago next summer. And I kind of gave in and I said to him, I said, well, why would we want to do that when we could go all the way to Boston? So I've... Uh, kind of gotten over the fear that things don't have to be that far by getting on my bicycle in 1985 and riding to Boston. And I've done that a few times since then. Interesting in getting ready for this presentation, because one of the things that, that came up was, even though I pretty much thought I got rid of that filter, uh, I was thinking about Sydney and how 
I had a friend when I was 48 years old move to Australia, and he said to me, he said, Ken, why don't you grab your bicycle and hop on a plane and come over here, and we'll do a bike tour down the Great Ocean Road. And I said to him, I said, that sounds like a great idea. However, I don't have a passport. Uh, I think up until that point in time, something in the back of my mind was telling me that traveling abroad was too far and that there was enough in my own backyard to say that I didn't need to go anywhere else. And at 48, I got a passport and flew with my bicycle to Australia and rode the Great Ocean Road and proved to myself that even Australia doesn't have to be that far. Since then, I have taken multiple trips to Central America and Europe and plan on doing several more because I don't think anything nowadays can be too far. So that's, that's one filter that I got over. Uh, another filter that my, my mother, my wonderful mother gave me was the fear of heights. And in Los Angeles, back in the 1960s, we had a brewery in the middle of the San Fernando Valley, uh, the Bush Brewing Company, and they had a little kind of amusement park that was attached to it. And they had a monorail. And the monorail went through the brewery and it would stop at different windows and they would explain the different process of how they made beer. Well, I'm just a kid. I was about three years old getting on a monorail. That's all I cared about. And as soon as the monorail left the station, and this wasn't like a big Disneyland type monorail. This was a really small, small uh, setup. As soon as it left the station, my mother was on the floor in hysterics, crying. And I'd never seen my mother like this before. And she's just begging the right operator, make it go backwards, make it go backwards. I have to get off. And I remember him turning around really calmly and just saying, I'm sorry, lady, but this monorail doesn't go backwards. And I can let you off at the first stop, but you have to stay on here. And me just seeing my mother panicked. And I never realized what an impact that had on me until I was older and I was trying to get into doing things like hiking, riding roller coasters and doing stuff like that. And I found that every fiber of my body would not allow me to get near an edge of a building or anything tall. And that was something that was a little bit harder for me to get past that filter because my mother on some primal level was telling me that, uh, that heights are dangerous and we wanna protect ourselves. And I've done a lot of rationality of you know, things that, um, that can hurt me and that can't. And when I was in my thirties, I wanted to do a hike and uh, this hike is up at Yosemite National Park. And I knew that I needed to get over my fear of heights in order to do this and spent all summer doing crazy things, including going up in a friend's ultralight airplane uh, to try to get over my fear. And it still pops up from time to time. I was on a drop ride at a uh, amusement park in Germany last month. And you know, usually these rides, they go up, they hold you for a few minutes and they drop you down. And I do not like going up part. That's the scary part for me. But there was no line and I wanted to get my money's worth and get everything you know, I could in for the day. What I didn't know is that this ride, after it goes up and you're circling and you get a view of everything and you're so high up, what I didn't know is before it dropped you, it stopped and the car's tilted forward 45 degrees. So I think normally I would have had maybe the worst panic attack in the world. But working through this and trying to get rid of my filters, I just knew I could close my eyes, I could hold on, I could breathe, and that within hopefully 60 seconds, the whole thing would be over and my life would be okay, and I would be able to continue for the rest of the day. And that's what I did. So like I said, that's a filter that's a little bit harder for me to get over. Um, but once again, I didn't start working on that until later in life. So let me go down a list of, of some of the filters that come up uh, for us in the ACA Fellowship and what I work with with uh, most of my patients. One big filter is I'm not good enough. Now, this can be a belief that we are adopted, even though it might not be something that was verbally explicitly said to us. Maybe we just gathered this by our parents' actions, by our parents' uh, lack of ability and their abandonment. Uh, it could be many ways how we come up with this, but uh, just having this core belief deep inside that we see the world 
through the filter that no matter what we do or how hard we try, I'm not going to be good enough. Another filter is no one listens to me. I don't have a voice, so why should I try? I'm unlovable. I'm stupid. I must be responsible for everything and everyone because everything falls on my shoulders. And if I am not responsible, the world will cave in. I must be responsible. I must disappear. I have to be invisible. I can't make waves. And for the clowns out there, I must not feel pain. Let's never get into a situation where things can be so serious and so uncomfortable because if they do, then that hurts or somebody else must be hurting and we must not go there. So we must be funny, we must have jokes, we must break the tension. I'm amazed at how many meetings I'm in where there's dead silence and instead of allowing people time to sit in the silence, somebody will have to crack a joke and say, you know, can we move on to burning desires? Because we just can't sit in the silence because that might be too painful for us. So I'm not sure how many of you can relate with all of those. Uh, sometimes we can have a combination of those. Uh, sometimes uh, specific ones just really burn into our soul. And these come together with uh, the three core beliefs of an ACA adult child, which are don't talk, don't feel, and don't trust. Once again, if these are your primary distortions, everything in your soul tells you not to talk, feel, or trust. And think about it. My, my job as a therapist is a lot more difficult because my job is about getting people to talk to get in touch with their feelings and to trust the process. So I realize that it's not an all or nothing, but the people that I work with most of the time uh, have to work through this distortion gradually to get to a point where they can get to any feeling. So I wanna talk a little bit about the, the basic cognitive behavioral distortions. Uh, these are a little bit clearer. If anybody here has done any cognitive behavioral therapy before, you might've heard these before. Uh, but they are rampant with ACAs. Um, I really think that these simple cognitive distortions should be taught in school, probably around uh, third grade, fourth grade. I think if we could understand these at that age, we would start to just see the world with more clarity, despite the things that we've told. So the first cognitive distortion is called catastrophizing. Catastrophizing is when we think the worst case scenario, everything always has to go to doom and gloom. And this would be like Chicken Little. Chicken Little was going around the farmyard one day and a gust of wind came along and something hit her in the head and she started running around screaming, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. The worst scenario. And of course, everybody else was looking at her distorted filter and took it on to their own and everybody else got up in arms and was running around in panic as well. Now, the key with any of these distortions is looking for evidence. What evidence do you have to support this? What evidence do you have to believe this? If Chicken Little had stopped and looked around herself, she would have seen that there was maybe not a piece of sky next to her, but there was an acorn next to her, and she was standing under an acorn or an oak tree. So had she been running around screaming, acorns are falling, that would have been a lot more accurate. It would have been a lot more clarity. Always try to find the evidence. I worked with a woman once years ago who didn't think she was ever gonna be clean and sober. And her belief why was because when she was four years old, her mother told her she'd never not to anything. Okay. Now, I asked her what other reasons why she would believe that she could never be clean and sober. And you know what? She couldn't come up with any other reason. Here she's in her 60s, but because her mother told her she could never do anything right. So we looked for evidence in terms of what other things in her life had she done wrong. You know, clearly, she had a great career that she retired early from. She lived in an awesome condo down by the ocean. 
She had a great marriage, great kids. Her grandchildren adored her. She was active in her church. She retired early. She was a consultant for a job. All these wonderful things, okay? So her evidence told her the opposite. And once she realized that, she realized that she had to start looking through the world with a little bit more clarity based on the evidence that she could do things. And she came back to me a few months later and told me that she had missed her flight while, um, while flying somewhere. And the first thought that went through her head, this is that filter again, can't do anything right, was that everybody was going to be mad at her because she didn't get off the plane when she was supposed to and she can't do everything right. Then she looked for evidence and realized, I got to the airport on time, I checked in on time, I did everything I could have, it was out of my control, the airline screwed up, and that is why I missed my connecting flight. So people can be upset, but they can't be upset with me. So she said that's the time that she would have normally had a drink, but instead she went and she treated herself to an ice cream cup because she didn't have to see the world through that can't do anything right filter any longer. Okay. So uh, the next uh, common filter that we do is called polarized thinking. Polarized thinking is when we look at the world in terms of black and white and there's no gray area in between. So it's not like, um, you know, I love you, Ken, but we're having a disagreement. So I'm a little angry with you right now, but I still love you. It's uh, I love you, Ken, until you say something to piss me off. And then I hate you and I never want to speak with you again. This is the polarized thinking. And a lot of this is stemming from the don't trust rule. Uh, because we don't, uh, as much as we want to trust somebody, it's too scary. So we kind of tend to push people away uh, when we think that maybe that they're getting too close um, because it's that push pull all or nothing. And as I tell people, these are the people that go to Disneyland and they're having the best day ever. And then all of a sudden, maybe they spill some popcorn on themselves or fi they find out that Space Mountain is closed. And all of a sudden, we need to go home. This day is the worst day ever. Everything is, is just horrible. So that's polarized black and white thinking. And the way that we usually identify with this distortion, as, as with most of them, is we can't always catch ourselves when we're thinking this way, but we can catch ourselves when we're having that instant shift with our feelings. And when we do, it's great to stop and look for the evidence. Why am I feeling this way all of a sudden when I was having such an amazing day a few minutes ago? What happened? Because we need to start looking at the world with the, the shades of gray and not all black and white, because the world is a whole spectrum. It's not absolutes. It's not always and nevers and alls or nothings. Another common one, a distortion is called personalization. This is when we think we know what other people are thinking about us. We think we know other people are talking about us. And it's really important that uh, we really care what other people are thinking and talking about us. And so we get very upset with this. And this can be as simple as uh, me leaving my office in the morning to walk down the hall to run to the bathroom because I just got out of session and I had a cup of coffee. And there might be some other patients that have just left group and they're walking down the hall too, going in the other direction. And I'm not wearing my glasses, so I don't see them and I'm only concentrated and focused on getting to that bathroom. And they walk by me and they say, hello, I don't see them, I don't hear them. And the next thing I know, they're going around telling everybody that I'm a horrible therapist, I'm only there for the paycheck because they looked right at me and said, hello, and I kept right on walking. So a lot of personalizing there. Um, looking for evidence if they came back and asked me and said, Ken, or, or, is everything okay with us? Because you walked right by me this morning and I said, hi, and you just kept on going. Yeah. That's the case, reality testing, looking for evidence. Gee, I'm sorry, I did not even see you this morning when I walked down the hall. I was oblivious, I didn't have my glasses on, I wasn't able to see you, so um, I'm so sorry. You know, next time, maybe step in front of me so I, you know, I totally will see you because I really don't want to piss anybody off. Um, so that's personalizing. And there's two parts to that. There's the, you know, first of all, stop it. Don't get into somebody else's head because you just, can't do it unless you really have a, a strong case of ESP. And the other thing is, you know, look at what's so important. Why do you really care what other people think? That's kind of the key. Um, 
Okay, a couple uh, lesser ones, emotional reasoning. These are uh, the distortion, the filter, when we feel like it, if it feels good, do it. Uh, it just feels right, uh, going by feelings. Um, feelings are very real to us, but sometimes they can be deceptive. And this is, like I said, once again, looking for evidence, uh, because sometimes we can rationalize things. Uh, fortune telling and future tripping is another filter that we see the world through sometimes. And we're always more concerned with, uh, with what might happen and what's happening in the future versus allowing ourselves to really be mindful of the moment and present in what's happening now. Uh, I know on my last vacation, uh, I was worried a lot what's going to happen a couple of days from now. I found myself looking at my phone quite often. And, and when these things would come up, I would all of a sudden click out of that and say to myself, wait a minute, turn off the phone, stop thinking about the future, take a deep breath, look around you. You know, you're not ever going to be here again, maybe. So enjoy this moment while you're here. Uh, global labeling is another filter. Global labeling is when we take one piece of information and judge a whole bigger picture on that one piece of information. It's like when I send somebody to Alcoholics Anonymous or to ACA and they come back and they tell me that they went to one meeting and they hated it and they will never go back because the entire fellowship is horrible. So you're basing an entire fellowship on just one experience. There's a story about three blind men that are trying to identify and describe what an elephant is like. And one of them is feeling the legs, and he says, you know, the elephant is like a, a tree. It goes all the way down to the ground, and it's very firm. And another one is feeling the trunk, and is saying, no, an elephant's like a snake. And the third one is feeling the side of an elephant and says, you guys are all wrong. You know, the elephant is like a brick wall. Three, three different examples of global labeling. Try to get... Uh, an idea of the whole picture. Nowadays, I think we see global labeling and it's really tricky in something called uh, social media and clickbait. You know, sometimes that we base an article on what the title is and we think this is information that's true and then we start acting on that when maybe it is misinformation. So really try to work on looking at the whole picture and not just taking one bite of the picture before coming to a conclusion. Another one that's similar to that is filtering. Filtering is when we have an agenda and we really don't wanna see the world any other way than, than the way that, that our agenda is. And for some people it's, you know, we, we have a need to see some people as always being mean and bad, or we have an agenda to see ourselves as always being the underdog and we never, never get our turn. I worked with a man years ago who had this agenda that he was HIV positive and refused to take meds because he found one website that explained that if you take these medications, you will stay sick and die, but that there were doctors on this website that said, if you don't take the medications and allow your body to heal from the HIV, you will be able to heal it on your own and to survive. And even though we had numerous doctors and nurses and health educators from all different angles coming in, and talking with him and the others, he held on to this one obscure website. And uh, so that's filtering. It doesn't get us what we really want in the long run. And then the last one, I say this for last because this is a fun one, and that's shoulds, thinking that the world should be a certain way, thinking that for all the good that we've done, we should be rewarded, or that the world should be fair. And it would be nice if the world was fair, don't get me wrong that there's a lot of unfairness in the world. And when we think things should be the way that uh, we want them to be, we set ourselves up for getting upset. I love driving places on New Year's morning because here in Los Angeles, everyone is either asleep or hungover and you can get on any freeway. It's the only day of the year you can get on the freeway and go anywhere. And this last year I was driving somewhere and there was a total traffic jam and I was upset. There should be no traffic on New Year's morning. Okay. But I share the freeways with 13 million other people. So what good is it for me to have that should? I need to accept that things are as they are. Okay. These are the common distortions, the common filters that we wear. And like I said, it's important to identify the feelings as they come up because these usually 
we have a huge shift in feelings suddenly or uh, drastic, this might be an indication that our, our, our filter is on and how can we see a little bit clear through the filters. Uh, from an ACA point of view, uh, I think that we really work on our filters in step six and seven. Filters can be our character defects or our survival traits. Oftentimes these filters are ways that we started looking at the world because they got us through our childhood and they helped us to survive, but uh, kind of usually cause a little bit more stress and grief for us as we go through our lives. So going on and, and working these and identifying these is step six and seven is, is, is great. Unfortunately, sometimes when we identify them in step six, we have to go back to step four because curses, we have a resentment now for our parents for giving us these, these filters. So we have to go back and work on that resentment later. Uh, I had uh, something come up recently, a character defect on a camping trip last week. And uh, I was being a little bit of a brat to one of my friends. And uh, you know, it was one of the jokes that I just took a little bit too far. And another friend pulled me aside and pointed it out to me. And I had about three seconds of defensiveness. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh yeah, this, this is one of my character defects. I kind of had, had pulled this a little bit too far. And um, once I was able to identify that, I was able to let it go. Uh, I was able to get past it because first of all, I had given myself uh, notice that I have not had that come up in a very long time. So I had pretty much released that. And that's, that's, that's good. I mean, it's not gone completely, but uh, I'm working on it. And, and then I kind of worked the step 10 after that, which is the, the friend that I was kind of um, you know, harassing. I went back to him and I uh, apologized. I realized that uh, what I did wasn't, wasn't cool. And uh, his response was, you know, to me, what are you talking about? He didn't even recognize it, and that's fine, but I was taking care of my side of the street. And I think that's what we do when we start to identify these distortions. And the more we identify them, the quicker we are to work through them and work past them, and then be able to take care of our side of the street. Now, I talked about how we have these distortions. Just remember, everyone else is wearing sunglasses too. And oftentimes, if you're having a conversation with somebody, maybe the way they're perceiving what you're saying is going through their filter. And then they're coming back at you with their perception, which goes through your filter. And maybe what they're actually hearing is their critical parent talking. And what you're hearing is your critical parent talking. So you might be having a conversation with somebody, but the reality is both of you are having conversations with people that aren't even in the room. Something weird to think about. Uh, I had somebody years ago after I made the comment, it's my observation that people who work the steps with a sponsor uh, get better quicker and stay healthier longer. And this person went on to blast me for five minutes telling me who the heck did I think I was telling somebody what to do. And I of all people should know better than tell anybody what to do. And uh, as I was being blasted, I started to feel defensive. I wanted to say something. I wanted to retaliate. I felt like on the back of my neck start to stand up. And then I was able to basically take a deep breath and say, this is this other person's distortion. You know, he did not hear what I had to say. And it's not really my responsibility for other people. I thought I was clear with what I said. And after about five minutes, once he calmed down, I looked at him and I said calmly, where I am in, in my program is at a place where I share my experience, strength, and hope. And that's all I did was I just shared what I saw. I didn't tell you what to do. And um, I think that's important when we can start to see other people's distortions and we don't have to react upon them because that just creates a huge chain reaction and I know that all of us have been there before and it's so unpleasant and that's what we're trying to work through with recovery. So a coping tool I like to talk about is visualize an invisible fish hook coming down. And when that person is coming at you with something that is totally out of left base because you remind them of their mother, or their father, or their boss or somebody, whoever it is, when that fish hook comes down, you wanna bite that, you don't have to okay? because you don't have to, to, to wear their hysteria, 
their distortion, you're catastrophizing. Um, that's what recovery is all about, learning how to be calm. Um, a lot of good stuff out there on the internet as far as cognitive behavioral therapy and common distortions. If you can talk to your, your if you have a therapist or a sponsor, talk about that. We're kind of in steps six and seven. And uh, I just kind of want to wrap up by saying with all this insanity of having our filters and wanting to get through them and pass them, I just want to leave you with four words to live by. These four words to live by are don't sweat the small stuff. I'm Ken Francis from Los Angeles, California, and thanks for listening. Thanks, Ken. Please join with me in thanking Ken for his time today to speak to us. Thank you, Ken. 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 Awesome. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken. As is, Thank you, Ken. As is tradition, we close the recording before we move into question time uh, with the extended serenity prayer. If you would all like to unmute and join with me. Who brought us here? God, grant me Thank you for joining us and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs>